for me, the most valuable parts of coming here, I, I thought were largely the, the community, like people I worked with, the brand, and then what I learned. Hello, I'm Lindsay Aiken, and I manage career services at the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University. Welcome to ms &E Graduating Student Profiles. One of the strengths of the ms &E Masters in Science program is that we have a part-time option called the Honors Cooperative Program. Here at Stanford, we love our acronym Alphabet Soup, so that gets shortened down to HCP. The HCP modality means that we have several working professionals who are completing their degree while they continue to work in their paid jobs. I'm delighted to talk today with Jeff Hansen, one of our HCP students. Jeff has been instrumental in helping to build a sense of community within this group, so we'll be exploring that, as well as his experiences taking full advantage of all the flexibility that being an HCP student affords. Jeff, thank you for joining us today. I know this flexibility was one of the things that attracted you to the master's program, so let's start with why it was important to you, as well as your other reasons for applying. Yeah, thanks for having me, Lindsay. Uh, excited to chat with you. As you said, the flexibility was one of the important factors of wanting to come and uh, do this program. I came from a little bit of a non-traditional background. I got married right after undergraduate. I started having kids and I was working. And so for me, I was looking for a program that would be flexible in both potentially how the program was delivered, mm -hmm. where it could be in-person, could be remote, and then the duration of it, where I could do it short if I want to, or I could I may mean, take a few years, or I could kind of go in and out if I'm working on other work projects. And then also content-wise, wanted something that was flexible um, that would let me pick and choose topics. I mean, it'd have a kind of a concentration of areas I was interested in, mm -hmm. but would also allow me to, to focus on other kind of tangential areas that, that I thought were interesting. Mm -hmm. So those are the main reasons I was uh, interested in the program mm -hmm. outside of the main kind of domain knowledge I would learn here. Mm -hmm. And so how did that ultimately end up working out for you, that flexibility, the other benefits that go around that, around pricing and scheduling? Yeah, I mean, it was super helpful. I've spent probably maybe four years total with a degree. The first, like when I initially got in, I actually deferred for a full year because I had work stuff coming up. So I didn't do anything for that first year. Mm -hmm. And then it was really helpful with COVID as well. One of my first classes was in January 2020. And yeah, COVID happened that year. So I did that and then I ended up just, again, deferring for another nine months after mm -hmm. that. It was also really good from a work point of view because I was able to, some quarters, be able to take more classes than others and then also be able to tailor the classes I wanted around what my work schedule was. Uh, I was working in management consulting for the first mm -hmm. little while, so I actually was able to use some of my classes for projects that I was working on, right? I would like choose a class that was specifically similar to the project I was working mm -hmm. on and so, yeah, I mean, my papers were similar to my work outputs. Yeah, I know that something that a lot of our students really appreciate when they're in the HCP program is that they can immediately apply what they've been learning. Do you have any specific examples of something that correlated like that or kind of within a few months? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of them was working on yeah, a consulting project. It was with like an HR department. We were working on a performance management consulting project. And so taking Bob Sutton's or behavior class, uh, really valuable for that. Uh, another one, I was working on a startup and we needed to do, like I was in charge of marketing. Mm -hmm. So I took the global entrepreneurial marketing class and literally the entire project was all of the deliverables I was doing for my work. <laughs> that and is so, so cool. Yeah, it ended up being really nice. Cause it also is nice because for your homework, you then have coworkers reviewing your homework, mm -hmm. right, to, and giving feedback on it. But also for your work deliverables, you have classmates and professors or advisors giving it kind of feedback on it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, yeah, it was a nice kind of virtual cycle and getting mm -hmm. feedback and, and doing well on that. So you mentioned that you've got kids and you were newly married. The realities of juggling work and family and schoolwork, that's a lot to juggle, I remember from you know, yeah. I did the same thing. My boss was part-time whilst having a family, yeah. and it's a lot of work. How were the realities of that for you? Yeah, absolutely. Like, one of the reasons I wanted to come to Stanford also was the, the family community, because mm -hmm. they've got a pretty amazing community for families um, on campus where you live in, like, all the families live together in a little gated area with big mm -hmm. playgrounds out there. Nice. And so that made it really nice um, from, like, yeah, like, you have a community to help 
raise your family together. Mm -hmm. So like with the juggling, it helps with that because we have a lot of neighbors who can help, right? Where if my wife's busy and I'm, I have class and we need help, like we've got neighbors, we can just knock on their door and mm -hmm. we can trade watching their kids. Yeah, and everybody understands all what's going on because it, they're living the same experience. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, a lot of like shared values, shared mindsets. Mm -hmm. so that, I mean, that was really helpful and really nice. Yeah, the other juggling stuff, it, it does get tricky sometimes. Before I came to campus, I would only take one class mm -hmm. per quarter. I would never take more than that. And depending on my kind of workload, I would choose which classes to take. Before I came to campus, I took three classes. Mm -hmm. I took two through the NDO, the non-degree mm -hmm. option, just to explore the program, see what mm -hmm. it was like. And then I took one as a fully enrolled, matriculated student through the HCP program. Mm -hmm. And so for those three classes, yeah, I was able to choose either easier or harder classes mm -hmm. based on my workload. Yeah workload of classes yes some yeah, not all with, units are created equal they even though not, they should be yeah yeah like some might only take five hours mm -hmm. right a week some might take 20 or 25 hours yeah and it's maybe a combination of like the work the actual kind of like workload of the class but also your background mm -hmm. right like i didn't have like a technical background so the programming classes took me longer than they would have someone who had the technical background yes. to start yeah that's what we always say to people is class that takes you that extra time might be yeah. A breeze for someone else, so a little challenging, but it, they're not going to have to give it the same amount of time, and then vice versa as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so like if I had a busy work schedule, I would take the classes that were really easy mm -hmm. that for me that quarter and do the five hours, right? That's what I did for those initial first kind of three classes, and then decided, yeah, I wanted to come move on campus. Mm -hmm. And on campus, you have to, if you want to live on campus, you have to take a minimum of eight credits mm -hmm. while you're like, yeah, to live on campus. So for that, I would typically just do one of the easier classes and one of the more challenging ones. Mm -hmm. Or if it was like a harder workload, then I would take two easier classes. Oh, I also, with my work, I just said, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna be doing 60 hours a week, right? Yeah. Like I just can't for the next little while. And if I do, I'd have to do a leave of absence, mm -hmm. um, which the, the university is pretty reasonable um, for accommodating those um, as needed. Just do like 30 to 50 hours a week would be at, like in, in work and then anywhere mm -hmm. between 10 and 30 hours a week in school. So it was busy. Yourself. It was busy. Yeah. But you just, you kind of, you figure out what you can drop and sacrifice. Something that we, we've talked about is that when people are coming back to grad school, you're sort of starting over again, building that community. That can be a hard thing to do, even for the full-time students who are coming onto campus and don't have the distraction of work as well. Yeah. Um, you recognize that for the HCP students, that's basically multiplied and you've done a lot of work around building a community mm -hmm. with that group can you tell us more about that so i mean the the program serves three distinct cohorts right the co-terms who are like undergrads doing a fifth year master's program yes. then there's external master's students that are doing the master's program and they're coming in from other schools and so when i came in and to live on campus i moved in with the same cohort of people who were coming on campus mm -hmm. And they're actually, people in that cohort really wanted community as well because like they're moving here and they didn't have yes. friends. And a huge part of the reason people come too is these friendships last you lifetimes. Yeah. In your careers, we hear things about people officiated at someone's wedding or they're involved with, you know, helping bring up kids. In, a absolutely, yeah. And yeah, so super valuable. And with the external masters who are here on campus, every year is a little different. Sometimes the, the incoming cohorts have closer communities than others. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the Graduate Student Association to try to help build community there. Mm -hmm. And we set up kind of regular ongoing, like weekly activities that were sponsored by the GSA budget, which was really helpful in creating community with the local masters or the full-time masters. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, then the HCP cohort, is, it's meant for people to be able to study remotely, right? And so most of the people are remote for a portion or all of the program. Mm -hmm. And so they have pretty different needs than the people who are on like on campus. Very much, and the time zones too. I mean, we've got students all around the world who'll never yeah. step foot on campus. Yeah, absolutely. So there's like a location difference, and then there's also a career stage difference. Mm -hmm. In general, like they're, I don't know, like I guess age would be anywhere from like 24 or 22 maybe, all the way up to like 50 or 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a very broad span of ages and career stages, but everybody essentially wants to come to school to learn while they're working. And we're in a similar stage of life where like it is maybe a little farther along in our careers. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a lot in common but there wasn't any formal channels or programmatic ways to, to connect with each other or even to know who these other HCP students were. 
and I think there's maybe 40 or so MS and EHCP students at any given time? It fluctuates quite a bit. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah, every quarter it's kind of people are coming in, people are that graduating out. You know, obviously the bulk of people will start in September. Yeah, so the HCP, like when I looked maybe six months ago, I think there were mm -hmm. 40 HCP MS and E students, which yeah, goes up and down. Mm -hmm. But like, I didn't know any of them for, the, for quite a while, for the mm -hmm. first year or so. And there's also HCP students in other programs, like in computer science or in other engineering. Yes. And there was no list or no way to get to know them. And so I reached out, I mean, it's probably you or Lori, right, who I reached out to and said, hey, like, any way to get in touch with them? And so, yeah, I mean, you said, yeah, we could send out emails to the entire kind of listserv mm -hmm. of these HCP students. We created a WhatsApp group and sent the link out to this listserv and got everybody on there and got everybody's contact details and started to set up um, events both locally and virtually Great. when we could. And it was a little bit tricky because people are all around the world, right? Mm -hmm. And people are in quite a few different domains. The main three would be like engineering, both software and hardware engineering. Mm -hmm. Then we have a lot of like data science, machine learning, and then product management. Yes. I'd say that encompasses 60 or 70% of the, the HCP students. Mm -hmm. People have different interests, but they're all kind of overlapping as well. So we'd, we would set up, like, we initially started setting up monthly um, meetings where we would, like, ask four or five of the, the students who had a, an expertise in one of these domains to come and talk about it, where we'd spend half an hour talking about uh, software engineering one month. And then, yeah, talk about it and then just ask questions. What are the latest trends? What's going on? And then just like have a Q&A, right, for people mm -hmm. who maybe are in product management who want to understand questions about software or vice versa. And so, yeah, we did a number of those kind of virtual events. In person, we've tried maybe once a quarter or so to do like a dinner or a potluck mm -hmm. meal um, on campus where people can get to know each other in person mm -hmm. a little better. And that's nice because maybe... I'd say half of the 40 people, when we created the initial contact list, half of the people lived locally mm -hmm. or somewhere in the Bay Area so they could, yeah. could get, get here. And then there's maybe four, or five, six of us that live like really close to campus mm -hmm. and they'd be coming to campus every week for their classes. And so for a number of those people, we would try to get together weekly for like weekly meals just on campus at like one of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it's nice to do all that. And I mean, the other thing that, that's nice too is, I mean, it's kind of like all the, the boundaries between those three groups, the co-term, the external masters, and the HCP are kind mm -hmm. of porous, yes, right? Like you can so. go back and forth, right? So, I mean, I did my first three classes as a HCP or NDO student, and then I moved to a full-time master's student. Mm -hmm. And then I did that for the next, I don't know, 25, 30 credits. Mm -hmm. And then for the last little while, I've switched back to an HCP student. Yeah. And so it's, I mean, it's really nice to be able to go back and forth. It and really is. So it's the same admissions criteria, or it's all the same degree yeah. as well. And then just the NDO that you've been mentioning, the non-degree option, where I always think that's really great is that someone who's graduated already and they've maybe been out mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years, some new topics they want to learn about, then they can come back and do that. And that's yeah. what a lot of the NDO students are doing. It's people who have an undergrad, maybe don't want to do a master's yeah. degree or don't have that in their bandwidth, can do these classes as sort of one-off, maybe yep. do a couple or maybe do four or five and get a graduate certificate too. No, absolutely. I mean, that was kind of how I viewed it. Uh, it, like almost like as an intro to the program as well, right? Mm -hmm. To give a little flavor of what the program is going to be like. And it's also interesting as an NDO student and the, the NDO program, they're the same classes as you're taking for the for the master's program. Yes, it's all the same. Classes. It's all the same. So you're with the Stanford students. Mm -hmm. So it, I mean, you get like you get to rub shoulders network wise with them already. You get the same content, and then you also get grades. You, yes. Like you're graded in the same pool. Well, I think for your own confidence as well, it's like going yeah. back to school. Like I'd been out for nine years, yep. and going back. You're just like, oh my goodness, do I remember how to write an essay? Do I remember how to study? Doing it like that when you've been out for a while just helps with your confidence and remember what you need to do and just feel like you can get back in the swing of things, okay? No, yeah, it, it absolutely did that. So I want to just pop back to something that you talked about earlier of some people coming onto campus and you told me a really cute story. A classmate I think was in Texas yeah. who wanted to do one of the classes that was only available on campus. I mean, a number of the classes are offered like fully virtual, but some like it is a hard requirement where you have to be on campus. And some of those work really well where it's only once a week, right? Mm -hmm. Where you could actually fly in. Others are like, no, it's like two or three days a week where you'd have to move on campus. Yeah. So this, this friend, 
there was one class that was twice a week, so we actually moved to campus one quarter, right? <laughs> and he, while he was on campus, we would get weekly lunches with mm -hmm. a number of the other MSNE and HCP students. Then he moved back to Texas, and he was working there, and another class, he like it, it was only offered in person, so he had to fly out once a week. He'd fly out, like, what, Tuesday night, and then fly home Wednesday, Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And one of our friends, who was another HCP student, offered to let him to come and stay at his house every week, which was really nice. I mean, not only did it, I'm sure, saved him a decent amount of money, mm -hmm. like it was an enjoyable experience too, because then he's able to go and hang out with another classmate every week. Yeah, then we just get to know him better. Yeah, and build I, those relationships. Yeah, yeah. I did offer to let him to stay at my place as well, but mm -hmm. he turned down staying with four little kids for some reason. <laughs> yeah, in a, I wonder why in, he did that. In a small three bedroom apartment. <laughs> Which is a smart choice. Yes, yeah. I think I would have made the same decision that yeah. he did as well. Yeah. One of the things that I've been really delighted about is, is how generous and giving, like, thoughtful the classmates are. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are coming to back to a master's program, whether it's HCP or whether it's the full-time master's, they're, they're coming back for, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but... A, Often it's you want to learn a lot. You just yes. like you, like you like learning, You've right? Got that intellectual yeah. curiosity. Yeah, a lot of curiosity there. Um, you don't have you didn't have the career opportunities you wanted, mm -hmm. right? Right out of undergraduate, and so you're like, well, what could what could amplify that, yes. right? And like so, there's those are probably two of the most common reasons why I see people coming back, mm -hmm. and pretty generous. A pivot. Oh yeah, actually that is the other one is a career pivot. Yep. Yeah. You see you see those three, and so all the people are pretty thoughtful, kind people. And so it's been like really rewarding if he would have thrown out and said, hey, I'm going to be doing, like on the WhatsApp group, I'm going to be out here once a week for the next 10 weeks. I bet there would have been five or six people in, open to helping him. Mm -hmm. And yeah, people are pretty yeah generous and giving and trying to help with startup ideas. Like we've had classmates who they say, hey, I want to work on, on a startup. And a few of them will say, hey, I'll work on that with you. Or I, I'll do this class with you and I'll help you. Or I'll, mm -hmm. like I'll be your programmer. Or I'll be your product manager or whatever. And yeah, both like for actual kind of like labor or guidance, right? Mm -hmm. Or like to work together on it or just to get feedback, right? Hey, I've got a startup idea that I'm working on. Anyone willing to go grab lunch with me? Mm -hmm. And there's always people who are willing to, to chat and help out. Yeah, I think particularly as we get older and it's interesting we to talk about the HCP t students do tend to be yeah. older is that just becomes more and more of our mindset of we love to help people out. We want to give feedback. We want to do things that can help yeah. people be successful in what they want to do. No, absolutely. In the the virtual meetings I mentioned, where we mm -hmm. had like the topic specific on machine learning or product management, the mm -hmm. HCP students were happy to um, invite all of the the masters or co-term students to join those as mm -hmm. well. The full time master students joined and like they'd reach out and say, "Hey, I'm interested in working in product at Google. Can I chat with you?" Yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's yeah, a good way to network and like learn more about specific companies and positions. Mm -hmm. And as alumni too, I mean, I know a lot of our alumni enjoy being called on for that sort of thing yeah. too. And so yeah, it just all feeds into this network and and that mindset that even as you graduate, you'll continue doing similar sorts of things potentially as well. I, I could see as an alumni like have, like getting a lot of value of like giving back and staying connected to, mm -hmm. to the students. Yeah, we love it when our alumni do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else that you want to talk about in terms of your experience? I mean, overall, it was an amazing experience. It, like I'm, I'm, I'm in my last quarter right now. You can start part-time remote. You can come in person. You can yep. go back to remote, but you can also take pauses in the middle. Yes. One classmate did that. He came, he was here for one quarter, maybe two quarters, had a business idea, went and spent four years on that business mm -hmm. and was successful with the business. Sold, I think he did it with classmates, not necessarily MSNE, but Stanford classmates, mm -hmm. sold the business and then came back again for one, like his last quarter. And finished it all and up. And finished his quarter, yeah, as a way to like, okay, I need, I need my next kind of career uh, I, I need I need some time to think about what I'm going to do next, mm -hmm. and so use that time to think about: Am I going to do another startup? Is there a new industry I want to work in, or things like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's really nice. And I mean, that's this last quarter I've only had one class, and that's kind of what I've been doing, um, and working on a startup. Mm -hmm. And it's nice because being on campus, you get access to just a significant amount of other resources. Because I'm working on a med tech wearable. And so, like, able to go and sit in on med school classes or email yes. professors or I mean, go drop by and knock on their mm -hmm. door, right? Or, or get access to the biodesign lab, right? And be able to get their mentorship and guidance, which has been really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. For sure. And so, in terms of now, as you're finishing up, you're working on your, your startup, 
this med tech product sounds really amazing. Is that kind of what you think you're going to be focusing on full time? Any other plans? What are yeah. As you go forward, the next five years, what's happening in the next five years for you? Yeah, next five years. I mean, short term is a good question. Either we realize it's not going to work or we, yeah, it does work and we're able to get funding and move forward with that. So that's that's the immediate short term, um, which could be, it could be three months, it could be six months, or it could be five years. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like if that doesn't work out, then the most likely option is to go work in product management at a technology company. And I mean, yeah, I could see myself if I find a company that's a good fit doing that for three to five years or longer. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of people out here. People, it's fun to work on startups, and so I, I see myself working either at kind of like growth stage companies or startups for for quite a while. Seeing where our alumni go, there's just so many different places. It's always really fascinating to see what worlds people end up in, what they end up doing. Yeah, it, it really is amazing, and. Yeah, I mean, I, the the main kind of companies I see a lot of alumni at is like, like doing their own startup, right? For sure. Doing a growth stage or like a big tech company. Um, and so we have our sort of final three questions that yep. we like to wrap up with. I'm gonna ask your advice for people coming into the program that they might not have already heard from someone else. A lot of programs have community built into it. The MBA. You mm -hmm. all start as a cohort. Um, there's other programs where you all start as a cohort. A trade-off of the flexibility of both the HCP and the MSNE general is the cohort isn't built in necessarily. Because when you get enrolled, you can start at any point during the year, right? Mm -hmm. You you don't have to start in the fall. And there's no set sequence that you have to do the classes in, yeah. too. That first quarter, trying to build a community, trying to get involved in other MSNE activities or meet people. For HCP, trying to find a way to build like network because like for me, the most valuable parts of coming here, I, I thought were largely the, the community, like people I worked with, the brand, and then what I learned. And then your life maxim, that signature phrase, I know you've got kids, anything that you keep saying to them that they roll their eyes at, that mantra for life. Yeah, choose ambitions and partners wisely. I think people who end up not happy in life have often chosen one of those two or both of them wrongly. Right. If you choose, like, you're, you can be highly ambitious in career things, which may not lead a lot of happiness. Right. If you're ambitious towards chasing money or mm -hmm. like fame, those. I mean, it's pretty clear those don't lead to happiness. Right. Yeah. So you can choose what you're ambitious in. You can be ambitious in in raising kids, in developing friendships, in, like in seeing the world. Right. And same with partners. Like you got to be very careful in who you choose for partners, both in business or in like uh, romantic areas. Yeah. And friendship, too. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And then finally, two books and a podcast. So a book that is MS&E or ms &E adjacent that is one that you feel like everybody should read would be helpful, then complete free choice, and then your favorite podcast. Yeah, so ms &E related book, I would choose. We had to read this one in my class. Is It was The Secrets of Sand Hill Road by Scott Cooper. If anyone's thinking of doing like a high growth or VC backable startup, it's, it's a great book to read because it gives you the mm -hmm. insights on what VCs are looking for, but also like the type of company you'd have to have mm -hmm. and the potential path that you'll have to take. And so, yeah, it gives really good insights on that. Free choice would be The Righteous Mind by, John, I think it's Jonathan Haidt. And it's a book, like the subtext on it is, why are mm -hmm. like good people so divided? And in this world which is so divided, there are very kind of mechanistic reasons psychologically why we're so divided and why we like divide into camps. Mm. And so he talks about why that is, how we bridge that, and then he talks actually a lot about religion in it and the evolutionary, like his view on the evolutionary purpose of religion mm -hmm. and why it can still be hugely valuable today to improving our lives. That sounds really interesting. It, yeah, it's a fascinating book. Yeah. And so your podcast choices? The only one I've ever listened to a full season of is called Against the Rules by Michael Lewis. Uh, he's the author of like Moneyball, Liar's mm. Poker, The Big Short. Each season he takes a unique topic, explain kind of what's going on in the world, and dives into, the, into it. And so the first season was on the referees of the world and why they're under attack. Referees such okay. as judges, police officers, actual sports referees. Mm. When, like, in most of these domains, they're actually doing better than they ever have in the past, but people hate them more than they ever have. Uh. And so, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah sounds that, that might link with that book that you chose. 
Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, nice partnership there. Yep. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. This has been so insightful to think about just the ways our HCP students are creating this the sense of community and then also the benefits of this flexibility as you've been able to apply it to your life and your family and your work. You know, I've been hugely impressed watching you go through the program. We all have. And again, really appreciative of all of the work that you've done. Wishing you every success for the future. Yeah, thank you. And likewise, and yeah, just glad that I could be here. It's been a real treat to both visit with you, but also to be, to be here at Stanford. Thank you for joining us for this episode of ms &E Graduating Student Profiles. This episode with guest Jeff Hansen was produced by Cecilia Canales, Chris Kong, and me, Lindsay Ecken. Our sound engineer was Owen Modest, and my editing partner is Jim Fabry. Our music was composed and performed by Catherine Barron, a student in our master's program. Please be sure to subscribe to us on Spotify or whichever platform you're listening through. You can find out more about the Stanford Center for Professional Development, the HCP programs and NDO option classes at online.stanford.edu. And you can find the ms &E department at msandeand.stanford.edu. See you next time. <laughs>